Chapter 7. Two good men. Beside the bed where part in life was laid in sorrow, guilt, and pain, by turns dismayed, the reverend champion stood at his control. Despair and anguish fled the struggling soul. Comfort came down the trembling wretch to raise, and his last faltering accents whispered praise. Goldsmith. A sensation created by the sudden death of George Vickers had run its course at a nine days wonder, and the mountain village had sank back to its, into its wanted quietude. The tailor had had no relatives in the inn, and all his goods were accordingly carefully put away till such time as instructions could be received from his London cousins. Mrs. Cooper had indeed been somewhat uneasy about retaining the ill-omened bale of goods with which the unfortunate tailor's illness was already connected in popular estimation in her house. But after it had been carefully repacked and stowed away in the loft by her sons, Jonathan and Edward, she grew more reassured in her mind. The nine days wonder had then exhausted itself, and for a short time longer, nothing new occurred. But on the day fortnight of the tailor's funeral, September 21, Edward Cooper complained of feeling ill. It was not his day shift for working in the mine, so he told his mother that feeling sick and giddy, he would remain in bed for an hour or two. But there did he remain until he died. The symptoms were exactly the same as in the case of Vickers. Mrs. Cooper, in an agony of fear, sent early in the day, imploring Mr. Mumpison's assistance, and in a very few minutes sufficed to bring him to the sick man's bedside. From the first manifestations of the mysterious symptoms, Edward Cooper gave way to despair. The death of his friend had made a deep impression on him, and he now felt sure that his own hour was come. It was sad indeed to see the strong, hardy young man who again and again had braved the dangers of the mines, now reduced to a state of abject terror. In vain did the worthy rector strive to calm his terrible excitement, and equally vain was the effort to rouse him out of the state of lethargy into which he subsequently sank. Mr. Mumpison, convinced that the swellings that appeared in several parts of the body were in some way connected with the essence of the unknown disease, now endeavored to separate them by means of poultices, but his success was very partial. He then applied stimulants, but to no purpose. The strange discoloration which had been observed in the tailor's case soon appeared on the young man's broad chest, and before the evening had closed in the passing bell, it was tolling for the widow's son. As in the case of Vickers, so now the rector urged that the funeral should take place as soon as possible. Poor Mrs. Cooper, awestruck, and well nigh heartbroken by the second visitation, offered no resistance. And accordingly, Edward Cooper was laid in his early grave on the morning of September 22nd. Men said it was long since there had been an interment in Eam churchyard, while as na yet nature had not been granted time to conceal the freshness of the last made grave. Cooper's funeral was not largely attended. So sudden had been his death that some had not heard of it. Many affected to disbelieve the report, while others who knew it to be all too true endeavored to preoccupy their minds with other thoughts. For indeed, there was reason for the growing alarm. It was whispered round that Peter Hawk Hawkworth has been taken ill a few hours after Cooper. No one liked to believe the tale, yet no one could 
forbear repeating it. Peter was known to be intimate at the Cooper's house, and it was said that he had been assisting the tailor in some matters at the very time, or shortly before that, when the latter had been stricken with his fatal malady. When the rumor gained ground that Edward Cooper was dead, it was asserted with equal confidence that Peter Hawksworth was dying. But when on the morning of the 22nd, Hawksworth was certainly seen dressed and standing at his cottage door, the panic was partially allayed. And a few even said that Edward Cooper was not dead at all. Thus rumors of hope and fear fitted up and down the long village streets, blown backwards and forwards, whirled hither and thither, like straws and dust upon the windy day. Soon indeed, it was plain to be seen that Edward Cooper was being borne to his last resting place. But as an offset, one told how Peter Hawksworth, while admitting to having had a cold and shivering fit, had said gaily, though the reporter witnessed that he looked far from gay. Why, it is coming to that pass now, that if a man sneezes at bedtime, they will have his grave dug for him by sunrise. Peter was even a brave, fearless lad, said Unwin of the town head when he heard it. It's spirit a man needs when sickness is on him. And that's where poor Cooper failed for all his strength. But even Unwin's merry tongue was silenced when passing through the church, churchyard on the afternoon of the day after Cooper was buried, he saw a third fresh-made grave and was told that brave Peter Hawksworth lay there. He had fought bravely, keeping his feet almost to the last, but neither for him came there any reprieve. Matters now began to look really serious. Three days more, and the fourth grave was opened and closed. Thomas Thorpe was one of a large family, and Mr. Mompison had a sad presentiment that the mysterious disease having entered another house would not readily depart from it. Still, for two or three days, there seemed no further cases cause for alarm, and people of the most hopeful sort began to breathe freely again. On the morning of the 29th, the rector, looking in for a moment as he passed Seidel's cottage, observed that Emmett's sister, Sarah, was looking pale and ill. At another time, he would not have given this circumstance a second thought. And the girl herself said that she was merely suffering from a slight headache. Dreading to excite the fears of the family, he forbore to press his inquiries further, but contented himself with administering some medic medicine to the girl, which he hoped might do her good. And so it went his way. Full, however, with sad forebodings, the girl's face haunted him throughout the day, so much so that even after a hard day's work and a long walk over the hills, he felt constrained quite late in the evening to call at the house again. The house place was empty, but hearing voices in the room beyond, he went quickly in. He drew back at the scene that met his eye. The whole family were kneeling round the bed on which Sarah lay while Thomas Stanley in the midst were offering, was offering up an earnest prayer. The rector waited till he had ceased and then came forward. The girl was dead, having breathed her last quietly about half an hour previous to his arrival. Mr. Stanley, her mother's friend, had been with her and had closed her eyes. After a time, the two clergymen left the house together. As has been said, there had not hereforth been much intercourse between them. Mompesson, reserved and sensitive by nature, felt a certain awkwardness in presence of the elder man, whose vacated place he had been called upon to occupy. On the other hand, Stanley, keenly conscious that he was the representative of a worsted cause, held that any approaches to intimacy should come from him who now filled 
responsible legally established position. Hitherto, therefore, the occasional intercourse between the two men had been characterized by dignified reserve and mutual respect. But now the hour has struck when the artificial barriers that kept the two noble spirits apart were to be thrown down forever. I do trust you will believe it, sir, began Stanley in a formal style, that I would not have been forward to take your place at the bedside of one of your flock were it not for the pressing grief of the household and being well assured that you were abroad and would not be early home. Sir, responded Mompesson cordially, you need not speak aught by way of apology. It rejoiceth my heart unfeignedly to know that in my absence, avoidable as it was, the poor child had even such as one as you to console her. And I trust and indeed to assure myself that by your comfortable ministry, she was enabled to make a happy end. She did indeed depart out of this life most peaceably, being well encouraged and sustained by a most lively faith and sweet assurance of her Savior's love. Would to God that all to whom call may be come by found in so excellent a posture. You fear then, said the rector, that some grievous trial of sickness and pestilence may be coming upon us. I have that dread heavy upon me, answered Stanley. You have perchance not heard that Mary Thorpe too be dead this afternoon while her daughter Elizabeth, as also poor Matthew Benz, be sickening of the malady. Nay, this is a most terrible and weighty stroke, cried Mompesson, and may be token yet more grievous blows to come. Being far afoot today, I have not heard of these fresh afflictions. Master Stanley, I will have your judgment on the nature of this malady. Thomas Stanley, walked on a few moments in silence. Then turning to Mompesson, he spoke with un unusual gravity. I like, I like not, dear sir, to be a prophet of evil, but truth to be say, my heart misgives me. The aspect of this disease is so terrible and stern. I recall nothing so cruel in its violence since the plague was at Kerber, not far hence, as you know, in 32s. I was a young man at that time, but never have I forgotten the doleful sights I then beheld. The plague, cried Mompesson. God help us then, for this is a most deadly thing. I've been advised of the havoc he has made in London this last, this year past. But how can such a pest have reached us here in our healthy mountain village? I mislike the thought of the, those cast-off garments that the poor tailor vicarious caused to be imported here from London, said Stanley. May it not be that the secret contagion of this disease was hidden away therein? I've heard say that anything of wool and texture is most convenient for the conveying of maladies of the infectious sort. For a while, William Mompesson made no reply. For himself, he had no fears, but the image of his delicate wife and of his two pretty babes rose before him. He shuddered as he recalled what he had heard of the horrors that had taken place in distant metropolis during the summer of that very year. He thought of the young girl he had just left lying dead among her wailing family, and the vision of his own home desolate by a similar blow flitted before him like some ghastly nightmare. But even as the possible hor horror of the future opened out before him in the black abyss, the man felt his spirit rising to the face, to face the dread emergency. When he spoke, it was with calm resolution. You have but given a name and form to fears I had myself entertained. But if the Lord should even call us to pass through the fire, I trust we shall each have the prayers and sympathy 
of the others to help in the time of trouble. I am with you, heart and soul, sir, cried Stanley, surprised and delighted at the warmth of the usually quiet rector's words. And it shall be my prayer that our God may be with us both, that as are they, so may our strength be. They were now close by the rectory, and Mr. Mumpison invited Stanley to enter with him. It was not without a struggle, painful though brief, that Thompson, Thomas Stanley brought himself to accept the invitation. He had not crossed the threshold since the day that he had ceased to be a master there. And it seemed strange to him that now to enter as a guest. He was soon, however, set at his ease by the gentlemanly courtesy of the rector and the sweet simplicity of his fair wife. The conversation was long and earnest. It was the first of what proved to be a long series of debates in which these two brave men consulted and planned measures together for the welfare and, if it might be, the protection of that heroic little community of sufferers.